Good morning, everyone. We are in the aviary. Welcome back here. Today we're going to be talking about a different bird species, but we're going to give everybody just a little time to join us today. And then we're going to learn we're going to about, about Loki, our Cenarius vulture. He was a chick that was born in 2018, and now he resides here in his own little digs in the aviary. And he is such a cool guy that we said we have to devote a live feed to him. So we're going to give you guys a couple moments to join us here. And then we will be talking to Keeper Ellen. And she is going to radio and have uh, another of our keepers actually let Loki into his exhibit so that you guys can see his full dramatic entrance. While we're waiting, let's give a few shout outs. Hey, Jenny Blos, good to see you and the whole SEAL team. Hi, Alan, thanks for being a member and tuning into these. We really appreciate it. Hi, Ashton and Lily in Florida. Hope the weather is better down there for you guys than we're experiencing here today. Thank you guys for tuning in this morning. Hi, Athena, Caden, and Rebecca in Michigan. We just love that we are all over the country and all over the world to bring the Toledo Zoo to you guys. Good morning, Edward in New York. Hi, Colton, Cassidy, and Isabel. Glad you guys are joining us. Hi, Davin and Evan. Hi in Texas. Very cool. We love this, you guys. Hi, Jayla, Talon, and Natalia. And, oh, I'm sorry, and Weston in Michigan. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Isabel and Xander in Detroit. Hunter, Isabella, Serenity, and Karison. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, Izzy. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, Lisa. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hi, Aiden, Macy, Cooper, and Gibsonburg. Oh, I'm so glad you guys love Loki. This is going to be a great, great live feed for you. Hi, William. Hi, Diane in California. Hi, Jessica in Michigan. Hi, Austin. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. We got a lot of people joining us from Michigan this morning. And so we want to welcome you guys back to the aviary. As you can see, we are geared back up here with our masks. And if we were going to touch anything, we would have gloves on too. It's for, the, for our safety, safety of our keepers and the safety of our animals. And we hope you all out there are keeping safe, keep that proper social distance, stay at home and stay connected with us here at the zoo. You can go to ToledoZoo.org for all the ways that you can stay connected. We're doing Facebook Lives every weekday at 1030, moving all around the zoo. We're doing Meals on the Go on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This week's entree choices are chicken wings or chicken chunks with macaroni and cheese and baked beans. or beef fajitas chicken fajitas with rice chips and salsa get your orders in now they are going fast and the food is delicious and it feeds the whole family all you have to do is get online click and pick it up curbside we love it we're also doing a bunch of virtual classrooms with our education department they're doing everything from training your pet to horticulture to moving around the zoo meeting creatures there's something for all ages check those out it's a very nominal fee, $3 for members, $5 for non-members, well worth your time. All right, and if you would like to help us sustain the zoo during these difficult times, we always have the donate button here for you, ToledoZoo.org to donate. Make us your Amazon Smile charity beneficiary or donate to our Facebook fundraiser. And if you have questions, check out ToledoZoo.org or you know, shoot us a message. We're always happy to answer whatever you've got. All right, today we are learning all about Loki and we are here with Ellen, one of our bird keepers, and she's going to tell us about this cool little guy. He's not so little anymore though. He's not so little. Loki himself is amazing. The species as a whole is amazing. We're gonna talk about both. But like Kim mentioned, I wanted you guys to get a chance to see how excited he is when he comes on exhibit. So I'm gonna call one of our other keepers to get him out here for you. Birds to birds, Jeff. And while she does that, we are right inside the door. You can go ahead and let Loki out. 
of the aviary, the very first exhibit when you walk in, and this is Loki's home. There he comes. All right, Ellen, tell us all about him. So this is Loki. Um, a lot of you, it sounds like, are familiar with him. He's kind of our showboat here in the aviary because he comes right up to the window, so hopefully you'll get an up-close look at him. He's been locked inside for the night to keep him safe when we're not here, but once he gets outside, he likes to stretch his wings, get a little bit of exercise. We do have a couple of food items here waiting for him bundled up that I'll talk about in a second. But Loki is a Cenarius vulture. He's one of the largest vultures in the world. Uh, the native range of the Cenarius vultures is Southern Europe, Central Asia, and Northeast Africa. Uh, his parents are here as well on site. He was hatched here at the Toledo Zoo. Uh, these guys are vultures in general. Most of their diet is made up of carrion, or dead animals. Um, and because of that, they're really important to us. Uh, one, they're kind of our cleanup crew, right? You see uh, dead animals on the sides of the road. Those can be a vector for disease or infection. So vultures really do us a service by cleaning up all these dead animals. Because not only is it a mess, but also, they, like I said, they carry disease. These animals uh, can carry things like botulism or tuberculosis or rabies. And vultures have a really high acid content in their stomach that can kill all of those diseases. So it really is important to have these animals here um, taking care of that mess for us. So in their native range, they are uh, near threatened. Vultures here, um, the New World vultures in the United States and the Old World vultures in the uh, Eastern Hemisphere do face a lot of threats. Vultures in the native range of the Cenarius vulture um, they're susceptible to accidental and intentional poisonings. Um, farmers will set out poisoned carcasses to try and kill dogs that might, you know, try and pick off their livestock. But then in some places like Africa, vultures are intentionally poisoned because they act as kind of a sentinel to poachers. So if poachers are trying to take down animals, the vultures show up and kind of act as an alert system to those people that want to stop poaching. They're also subject to, like a lot of animals in the world, habitat loss um, and fracturing of their habitat, reduction of their habitat. The smaller it gets, the fewer vultures that it can sustain. So these guys um, lay one egg a season. Their breeding season is about February to September or October. So Loki was a single egg that was laid in 2018. We do at the Toledo Zoo pull these eggs and we incubate them artificially. All right, he's about to get started on his food here. I've got um, a rat in that little pouch. What we like to do is, again, these are carcass feeders, so we like to kind of give them the experience of tearing open a carcass. So we'll take their food and we'll kind of wrap it up and bundle it so they get the, get the experience of tearing it open like they would in the wild. But again, so Loki, uh, him, when he was an egg, he was artificially incubated. And part of the reason we do this is that we have some issues with eggs being broken, either because the parents are really eager to switch off um, when they're incubating, or there can be, maybe there's some sort of a disturbance that causes them to break the egg. So what we do is we pull the real egg and we give the parents a fake egg. So they'll incubate that fake egg thinking it's real while we safely incubate the one in our breeding center. And then as soon as the egg hatches, we have our vet team look at it, make sure the chick is healthy, and then we'll return the chick with the egg pieces back to the nest and the parents will assume that that is their hatched egg and they'll begin feeding it. Now in the case of Loki, when we returned him to his parents, there was a couple factors at play. One was we had some really rough weather around that time and he got pretty cold and he got really compromised. So we pulled him back to our breeding center so we could make sure that he was okay, that the vets looked after him. We tried to reintroduce him to his parents. His dad did a great job. He still recognized him as his chick, but his mom unfortunately kind of lost that parental bond despite our efforts to keep her um, involved. So what ended up happening was we moved mom off of exhibit and then dad was a single parent raising him on his own. He was supplemented by keepers. We gave him a little bit of help. We gave him some extra food um, to make sure he was getting enough. But single, single dad Eddie actually raised Loki all on his own. And hey guys, while she's going here, we just want to let you know he is... Uh, in the process of eating the rat that she put out. Parents, if this isn't something you want your little ones to see, you've got a little moment here before he really gets into it, but we just wanted to give you guys a heads up. But the reason that we do this
is so that they get to use those natural behaviors and to truly be a vulture. So this is what they would do in the wild and we think it's important that all of our animals behave as they would in the wild. And so this is actually something we promote, but again, if it's not something you guys wanna see, feel free to you know check out the questions or uh, maybe turn up the sound and listen to Ellen go a little yes. more here. It's, it's you know, definitely a little unsavory to see. It's certainly not a meal that we would choose, but um, this is a very natural behavior for these vultures. And like Kim said, we really wanna make sure that we give them as enriching of an experience as we can. Now, people might see him alone and, and wonder why he doesn't have a buddy or a friend. And in the wild, these guys are pretty solitary outside of when they're in a breeding situation. Uh, so this is a very, very natural setup for him. Now, a lot of people have asked what the future of Loki is. He's so popular. People love watching him and seeing him up close. And we are looking at the possibility of getting a female and having a second pair set up. So we really would like to try to keep him here at the Toledo Zoo. One, because he's such a great ambassador for the species. Uh, but two, he's just, um, we've all kind of fallen in love with him. The keepers as well as, um, as our visitors really love this bird. All right, well, while he uh, eats for us here, we're going to answer some of your questions. So I'm gonna scroll back and see what we can find here. All right, so one of the first questions, I know when he was coming out, he spread his wings pretty, pretty well for us. What is his wingspan? Uh, the wingspan is about eight to 10 feet. So it's a, it's a pretty big wingspan. Uh, this is Loki or Cenaris vultures are one of the heaviest flying birds in the world. Uh, the females are a little larger than the males. The females can get up to 30 pounds. The males are still pretty close. They get up to maybe 25 or 28. Uh, but with vultures, you do find that the females are a little bit bigger than the males. And Roan wants to know if he can fly to the top of a little tree or a bush here. He cannot. We actually, if you guys saw his wings up close, um, we do trim a few feathers out of his wings because this exhibit is not covered and we certainly don't want him to fly any further than the exhibit. So we do keep his wings trimmed um, so he can't get too high. He'll kind of use his wings to fan in the breeze and he'll hop up on his perching, but um, he can't fly very high just because of that. In the wild, how fast can they fly though? How fast can they fly? That's a very good question. And I am not exactly sure how fast that they can fly. That'd be a cool thing that to That would Google. be a cool thing to look up. I did, um, I have read that Cenarius vultures have been seen around Mount Everest at heights of 22,000 feet. So they are actually metabolically set up to be able to breathe in these lower oxygen um, atmospheres. So pretty, pretty incredible flyers. They must have to be, they're probably going pretty fast to be that high. Definitely. And Teresa, we hope you can see how we're feeding him as she mentioned. Um, to promote those natural foraging behaviors and you know ripping and things apart she does wrap a lot of his food up so that he is ripping and tearing and using all of those natural behaviors um, and we do feed them more today is a rat day we do feed them like knuckle bones from cows or ribs we do a lot of different items the Cenarius vultures actually have here what's called a fast day there's a day of the week that we don't feed them and the reason we do this is because in the wild, they're kind of metabolically set up to maybe not find food some days. You know, on days they have a lucky carcass and everyone con congregates and eats a ton, they might really gorge themselves. But in the wild, there might be days that they just don't have a lucky find. So because they're set up to do that, we actually have a day of the week that we don't feed them. And that's completely natural. And Evan age three asks, how long do they live? In the wild, about 20 years. Um, there's always a little bit of a difference between wild and captivity. Obviously in captivity, we, he's safe here. He's got you know good food. He's got vet care if he were to get injured. So in captivity, they probably go up to 30 years old. Very nice. And yes, a lot of you were commenting on the noise that we heard in the background. And those were actually the hornbills that we featured last week. So as, as somebody commented, they weren't sure that Loki was the star today. They oh. thought it was still their turn. Huh? You know, these birds are always fighting for the stage. That's for sure. Absolutely. And Kayla wants to know how old Loki is. Loki was born in April or hatch rather in April of 2018. So we're actually April 18th. So April 18th will be his second birthday. So mark your calendars. He's coming up on that he pretty is. quick. 
And Roan was very um, astute, and he noticed that when he was sitting here earlier, he was able to almost turn his head upside down and almost fully around. Talk to us about sterity in their heads. You'll see him looking all around all the time. Um, these old world vultures don't have a sense of smell, so when they find their food, it's just based on sight. So they spend a lot of their time looking around. Um, they will also try and, if they're protecting a nest or eggs or chicks, they want to be really um, aware of their surroundings. So these guys are always looking around and moving. The other thing about their, his head you might notice is, you know, vultures tend to have a pretty bald head. Cenarius vultures have a bit more feathering and plumage than other vultures do, but this adaptation is a feeding one. So again, if he comes upon a big cow carcass or something and he wants to be able to put his head right in, it kind of helps to keep his head clean because it won't be a lot of feathers that are matted down. So that bald head is an adaptation for feeding. And Joey asks, does he have a favorite food? Well, if you can see how he's tearing into those rats, I would say that rats are probably his favorite food, although he's kind of playing with this paper here too. <laughs> uh, Loki was named for the Norse god of mischief, and we've found that to be a very fitting name for him because he is, again, he's about a two-year-old. He's very playful. He explores his environment. He so shows off for you guys. Yes, Check this he'll spend, out. As, he'll spend as much time playing with that paper as the food inside of it. So anything, again, we can do to stimulate him. All right. And Sam asks, who are their predators? They really don't have predators. Um, honestly, the biggest threat to Cenarius vultures is people. Like I said, um, poisoning, they'll be hunted for bushmeat. Um, people worry about them getting their livestock, even though for the most part, they're really only taking dead animals. So they have to be careful, again, that predators don't get their eggs or their chicks, but an adult scenarius vulture really doesn't have much to worry about from the animal world. And what's in this pouch, just so we can give this people a heads up? This pouch, I think, is also a rat. I think there's a mouse in there, too. All so right. We, and they are, they are whole. So once again, um, you know, if this is not something you guys are into, <laughs> now's the time to just kind of listen to Ellen talk yeah. about how cool this guy is. He is amazing look at this here <laughs> i know i think this is um how a lot of people are used to seeing him is right up here on the glass and i would venture to say that this is probably the only place in the world you can get this safely close to a scenarius vultures he really does uh he loves the opportunity to come up come up and check out guests and we worried at first that it was stressful maybe you know seeing all those people wasn't natural for him but he loves it. He comes right up to the glass. He likes to check people out. And I think our visitors are just as enriching as his food is. Absolutely. And Alex wants to know, are these vultures monogamous? They are monogamous. That's a great question. Um, they're monogamous like our pair, Eddie and Alice, uh, his parents. So in the wild, not only would they have loyalty to their partner, but they'd also have loyalty to their nest site. They would return to the same nest site every single year. Um, if something happens in the wild to one of the one of the pairs, then they would repartner. But as long as a pair continues to be successful and produces successful chicks, they'll probably stay together. Um, they do have a lot of success reproductively in the wild. Uh, the success rate of eggs hatching is 90%, which is incredibly high. And they they guess that about 50% of those chicks make it to adulthood. And 50% is a pretty high number. So. They really are successful. If you guys see how he ate that mouse whole, uh, part of the reason we give him a mouse is we're kind of preparing if there ever was an issue with his health and we needed to medicate him, we want him to be used to having these little food items. So if we ever had to give him medicine, we could put it right in that mouse and he would eat it whole. And that would be a lot safer than us, say, having to catch him up every single day to give him his medicine. So that's part of the reason we offer them a mouse too. And talk to us again about why we do these carcass feeds, just sure. for people who may just be tuning in. And we know it's not you know, always what you guys want to see, but we are trying to do this in the interest of the animals, but also educating you guys about you know, how important it is for our animals to be animals. Absolutely. So in the wild, these guys are pretty opportunistic and they'll, take, they'll go to any carcass they can. They might even take small reptiles or small mammals. But for the most part, what they're eating are these really large animal carcasses that they find. So part of getting into a carcass is tearing the, tearing the fur and tearing the hide and getting through bones. And we want to make sure that he still has that experience. So we wrap all his food up and we'll put it in boxes. We'll put it in bags, um, all sorts of different items, because it just gives him the opportunity to utilize these natural behaviors of 
you know, getting into where all the good stuff is. Absolutely. And Jack and Maddie want to know if he'll eat the entire rat like the mouse. He usually leaves some of the rat. He, uh, he'll leave the hide. He doesn't usually eat the tails. There's not a lot of nutritional value there. Uh, they tend to go for the really dark red uh, items inside of the rats, uh, but he can be a he can afford to be a little bit picky. Uh, so yes, he usually will. If he leaves anything, it'll be the the fur and the tail. And Hillary, yes, his parents are here at the zoo, Eddie and Alice, and they are over just outside of the birdhouse, going towards great apes in mm -hmm. the Cenarius vulture exhibit. And talk to us again about how he ended up here. So Eddie was with his, his dad for a number of months before he was able to be on his own. Just like in the wild, eventually the, the kids have to leave the nest. Uh, so when Eddie did that, he ended up getting his own space. So we just tried the space on a whim because we liked it. It was a good way to display. And we were just so fortunate that he was so good at displaying that people really got a good experience seeing him up close. And I did want to mention that um, we are in the middle of their breeding season and Eddie and Alice did have an egg last week. So we have pulled that egg into our breeding center and we're hoping that we'll have another fertile egg and that they'll have another chick this year. We will keep you guys posted on that. That's really exciting stuff. And Jason, age 43, <laughs> asks, how sharp are his claws? You know, I will say that they are just about as sharp as they need to be. Um, so his talons and his beak are suited for being able to, again, tear through these animal hides and through that, through that fur. And if it can tear through an animal hide, it can definitely go through some human skin. I have actually, our last chick that we had, uh, I wasn't fast enough and he got some of my hand and it got through the skin. So Ooh, yeah. they're definitely sh as sharp as they need to be. And we take great care when, we, when and if we have to handle these guys. And Alba wants to know, do they hurt people? They don't hurt people. They're, again, they're very solitary. They spend time on their own. They're looking for uh, places to feed. They, even where they nest and where they breed is pretty far away from people. They, they kind of prefer it that way. They want to be in the hilly mountaintops, high in the trees. So these guys, for the most part, would not want to interact with people at all. And Braxton, age six, asks, are their feathers soft? Well, birds have a number of different kinds of feathers. So the feathers that you see covering his body are called contour feathers. So those kind of give him that sleek shape and they're water repellent. Those are kind of like the feathers you might find on the ground if you're outside. But he'll, so those are a little bit more, uh, they're a little bit more rigid. But if you can kind of see his head feathers and maybe underneath his wings, that's where his downy feathers are. And he's going to show them off for you he guys will. right he's now. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so the downy feathers are just like we use down in clothing and blankets because it's really soft and it's really warm. And those feathers underneath his contour feathers help to keep him warm. So like on rainy days like this morning, you might have been able to see the water kind of beat up over his back and over his wings, but underneath those downy feathers are gonna stay nice and dry and keep him really warm. And Casey, age five, asks, how large are their eggs? Their eggs are, they're much larger than a chicken egg. Um, I don't know that I could give you exact dimensions, but you know, they're probably maybe four inches at the longest. They're a, it's a pretty big egg. And Karis Ann, age nine, asks, are they scared of water? They're not scared of water. Um, you know, they, they'll take an opportunity to bathe in the rain to get their feathers clean. Uh, we certainly provide them water. They get a lot of the water they need from the food that they eat, but um, they drink water as well. And Gavin and Grayson in Kansas City want to know, where do Cenarius vultures live in the world? They live in the world, they have a kind of a big range. So they are in Southern Europe, Central Asia, and Northeast Africa. So kind of right there through the Middle East. So it's, it's a pretty big range, um, but they find that the birds are kind of loyal to whatever areas they're from. There's different populations of Cenarius vultures, and they do migrate to an extent as well. And Janine asks, is Loki full grown? Loki is full grown. He will, his feathers are gonna change in color a little bit. Uh, they get the name Cenarius for like cinder, so kind of an ashen color. So he's still pretty dark. For A juvenile is still pretty dark. So if you guys ever come and see Eddie and Alice, or if we just wait a couple of years, you're going to find that the feathers on his head that are really dark, almost black, are going to kind of turn to a paler, uh, more light brown. But size-wise, he's about full-grown now. 
And Dana asks, how much does he weigh? Loki is, I think he's about in the 20, 25 pound range. So he's a pretty big bird. You know, when we, uh, he, can, he can put some weight behind him if he needs to. And Loki is a boy and he was born here um, almost two years ago to the day. You said his birthday is April 18th. Mm -hmm. So he's coming up on his second birthday. He is. And let's see, um, Knox, age four, wants to know, does he eat chickens? You know, he would eat a chicken if he was given one. Uh, that's not one of the food items that we provide, but these guys will, especially in the wild, they're pretty much gonna take any opportunity to get a meal. So if they were to happen upon a chicken, they would eat a chicken. And Alan asks, is the climate here the same as his native climate? Not quite. We have such a, a diverse climate between heat and cold. Um, so these guys can actually tolerate a lot. Again, there's populations in Africa and there's populations in, in Asia and the Middle East. So they can handle pretty cold temperatures and they can handle pretty hot temperatures. So they're, they're pretty solid in that way. But what's nice is you can see these guys out in the snow on a, on a cold winter's day. And because of that, we can exhibit them all year round because they are really hardy to all temperatures. And you mentioned that they've even been seen on Mount Everest. They have. Pretty far up there Pretty too. far up there and pretty remote. Wow, and Charlotte would like to know how far they can see. How far they can see. You know, I'm not sure exactly how far that they can see, but you know what, I would wager that they can see pretty far because these guys, again, need to see their prey or they need to see um, their food. So they'll be flying up high and they need to see all the way to the ground to be looking for, uh, they might find some cues. You, you'll find that if there's one vulture feeding, there could be as many as 20 vultures feeding. If there's a big food source, they're all gonna come down. So they will cue each other, but ultimately they need to be able to fly and see all the way down to the ground if there's any, any food for them. And Karasan wants to know if he'll hide in these bushes. You know, he does anything but hide. He tends to be front and center. Um, <laughs> You know, he likes to get the sun on his wings. He spends a lot of time um, out in the open. I don't know that I've ever seen him in the bushes. I think he just, he wants to be seen. And Presley and Stevie would like to know, does he have a tongue? He does have a tongue. I don't know if you'll be able to see it here. Oh, could, could you get it there? Almost. Uh, he'll kind of poke it in and out. Uh, but just like any other animal, he does have a tongue and he's gonna kind of use that to manipulate his food if he needs to. Very cool. All right, and let's just give everybody a recap in case they're joining us just now. We are in the aviary and we are talking about Loki, our almost two-year-old male Cenarius vulture who was born here at the zoo. His parents, Alice and Eddie, are on an outdoor exhibit just on the other side of the birdhouse. He has his own exhibit here where, as you can see, he's showing off for everybody. And today, we got to see him enjoy some enrichment and um, as you guys saw he tore open some bags and got some rats and he's been sitting here feasting for us and showing off really giving us a good look at his giant beak talk to us about why it's curved at the front yeah he's got that nice curved beak and at the tip of it is really sharp because he has to do a lot of work to get his food. His wild counterparts um, are sometimes ripping through really tough animal hides. You know, these are pretty small rats, so they're not as formidable as say, if you were to find a large cow or some large mammal. So he needs to have this really sharp beak and really strong beak in order to get through those hides so he can get to the food. All right, and we've got a few more questions coming in here. Does he see in color? They do to a certain extent see in color. I don't know that I could tell you the full spectrum, but yes, birds do see in color. And Olivia wants to know, when was the last time he had a bath? You know, probably this morning when it rained. <laughs> uh, we Birds are, are very fastidious. They spend a lot of time keeping themselves clean. So if you're ever at the birdhouse and you look anywhere, you're gonna see birds that are spending time on their feathers, keeping their feathers clean and in order. So he's gonna take any opportunity. For him, it's probably gonna be more of a shower. He's probably more a shower guy than a bath guy. Um, but yeah, any opportunity with the weather, just like it was this morning here in Ohio, we had some nice drizzly rain. That's a time that he can get his feathers all cleaned off and get them back in order. But, but even the sun, you guys saw him spread those big wings. He'll do that when it's really sunny outside. 
because the sun helps with, if he has any feather parasites, it helps clear that. It also helps him absorb that nice vitamin D and gives him some, uh, some extra nutrients as well. Absolutely. And Aiden, age five, would like to know if they will catch food while flying and carry it someplace else to eat it. These guys, for the most part, just go for dead animals or carrion. Um, there has been, they've been noted to take live prey, you know, let's say it's a sick or an old animal, but for the most part, these guys, they find a carcass and something to eat and they fly down to it and start eating. Um, they're not like the eagles, for example, that might catch things with their feet and carry it off. These guys kind of go to where the food is and just start eating there. All right. And Lori asks, how long does it take for their eggs to hatch? Oh, that's a really good question. Their incubation time is about 60 days, so about two months. It's a pretty long incubation. You'll find with birds, uh, typically the larger the bird, the larger the incubation is going to be. So if we had an egg last week, uh, hopefully in a couple of months we'll have, we'll have a little chick and something to report back on. And as she mentioned, they did have a, an egg last week and it is in our avian breeding center and we are hopeful that it is a fertile egg and Loki will have a sibling. Absolutely. So we will keep you guys posted on that and let's finish up here with a question from George and Elias. How much does he eat per day? So today actually he got a pound of rats. So different days will be a little bit of different items, but that's the amount of food that he usually gets. Um, there are certain items, like if he gets ribs or knuckle bones, uh, there's a little bit more bone that he can't eat and less meat. But yeah, today was a pound of food. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed meeting Loki and that you, when we get the chance to reopen, that you guys will come and see him. As you can see, he sits right up front and center here to check out all the visitors. So we hope that you guys enjoy him and we will see you all tomorrow.